years back, a friend of my brother's found out that I was a Buddhist monk, and so he decided to get a present for my niece. It was a little box. It was called The Buddha in the Box, a little plasticine Buddha, and a little booklet on the Buddha's teachings. And in it it said, the Buddha awakened to four wonderful truths, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. There's no laughter. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's what the Buddha awakened to, those four wonderful truths? <laughs> I had to sit my niece down and explain things to her. But more recently I read someone saying, well, the Buddha, yeah, to awakened to four truths, four noble truths. That was it. In other words, he didn't wake into anything transcendent. He didn't really put an end to suffering or anything. He didn't find anything unconditioned. He just found that there were four, again, wonderful truths to use in learning how to engage in life. And that's not true either. It was part of his awakening was discovering the Four Noble Truths, but he also discovered there are tasks appropriate to them. There are skills that you developed around the truths, each truth requiring a specific skill. The suffering, you want to comprehend it. The cause of suffering, craving, is something you want to learn how to abandon. The cessation of suffering is something you want to realize. And the path to that sensation, which involves dispassion for the craving, is something you want to develop. But the Buddha didn't stop there. Remember, the Dharma wheel has twelve spokes, and so far we only have eight. The remaining four spokes were realizing completed the duties with regard to all. And it was the completion of those duties that led to something beyond the Four Noble Truths. Because remember, the truths are part of the path, and the path does go someplace. If the Buddha didn't have a goal, he wouldn't have used the image of a path. There is a total end of suffering. There is a total release, and it's totally unconditioned. Another teacher I was reading said that, well, after all, release is something conditioned and cited a text in the canon where the Buddha starts out with dependent core rising up through suffering and then from suffering. talks about how suffering gives rise to conviction, and conviction gives rise to effort and joy, concentration, discernment, all the way up to release. In other words, release too is caused. Therefore, this writer said nirvana is also a conditioned phenomenon. It comes and goes. And she claimed to be able to dip into nirvana whenever she wanted to, with the mature realization that it wasn't going to last. And presenting this as if it was good news. Again, it's missing the whole image of the path. The path is something conditioned, but it can lead to something unconditioned. It's like gaining release from prison. You have to go through certain processes. All the paperwork, all the requirements that you have to fill, fulfill in order to get out of prison. But those processes, the paperwork, does not create the freedom you feel outside, that you find outside. That's something independent of the, the paperwork, the bureaucratic hassles. So there is something unconditioned. That has to be repeated over and over again, because for some reason there are some people who don't like the idea, whether it's because it makes them feel inferior or that there's a demand placed on them and there's somebody out there who's attained freedom, whereas I haven't attained freedom, therefore there's something wrong with me and I don't want to feel like there's something wrong with me, so let's 
now that you have to think about it. And that's just setting the bar so low that there is no such thing as accomplishment, there is no such thing as attainment, which is not a gift in any way at all. This was the Buddha's gift to other people. He found the path to a totally unconditioned freedom, and he was able to teach it. He showed the way, as in the Thai word net num. That he was able to advise, and numb, he was able to lead you there, show you the path, show you by example that this was possible. So even though the issue of an unconditioned freedom may not be your immediate problem right now as you're meditating, but if there were no freedom, that would be a big problem. It would shut the door on the idea that there is a total release from suffering, and we'd be stuck here. And how that can be good news, I have no idea. So rest assured, there is an unconditioned. And you can, through your efforts and through your desires and through your attempts to achieve mastery, it can be attained. There is an end to the work we're doing here. And so don't confuse the path with the goal. The path is one thing, the goal is something else. And part of the path is understanding the Four Noble Truths and learning how to use them. That much is true, but that's not the end. We want to learn how to see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths so that we can apply the duties, master the skills. But it's a very special way of seeing things. It doesn't come automatically. We read in some of the texts that the Buddha starts right out with the Four Noble Truths, but in others he has to work up to them. Basically he starts out with what's called mundane right view, which essentially is belief in the principle of karma and your actions, that your actions really do make a difference. The quality of your intentions really does determine the quality of the results. There are good and bad actions leading to good and bad results. A lot of us resist this teaching because as soon as we think about our past actions having results, we think about all the bad things we did. So, oops, they're going to come and get me. But that's not how the Buddha introduced it. When he's talking about mundane right view and the principle of karma, he'd start out with generosity and gratitude. The phrasing is, there is what is given, there is what is sacrificed, there is what is offered. Is what is offered. It sounds strange, but he's basically pointing to the fact that giving does constitute a meritorious act for two reasons. One, that you do have choices. And this is probably the essential part of the Buddhist teachings on karma and action, is you have choices. Things are not determined totally by the past. The results of past actions are going to crop up, but given the range of things that can crop up, you have choices in any one moment as to whether you're going to shape those experiences in a skillful or an unskillful way. So when you, when you give something, it's because you've made a choice. You weren't forced to give. And the action does have results. It does lead to positive states of mind, positive conditions that have real value. Because people have value. People have value because they can make choices. And as for gratitude, as the, Buddha, the Buddha starts out by saying there is mother and father. And this was. in opposition to a belief that your parents had no real virtue, or you didn't have any real debt to your parents because they just were doing things, acting, again, totally under, totally predetermined forces. So they had no choice in the matter. You came out, 
That's it. It was just a mechanical process or a biological process. Why don't you think the parents had choices? They had the choice to give birth to you. They had the choice to let you live. In many cases, they taught you how to speak, how to walk, raised you. You have a huge debt to them, even if they didn't raise you, even if they abandoned you at birth to be adopted by somebody else. At least they gave you the, the body you have. The mother didn't abort the pregnancy. So there's a debt to that. There's a debt of gratitude. Gratitude here means an appreciation of the goodness that other people have done for you. The fact that the happiness you have depends on the choices that other people made, the skillful choices they made. And there is a debt that goes along with that. And there's a lesson as well that we depend on the goodness of others and the hard choices that some people have to make. If we want goodness to continue in the world, we're going to have to be able to make hard choices as well. We can't just assume that whatever comes easy is okay. Sometimes you have to make the hard choice to go out of your way, to do something you know is really good, really helpful, even though it requires sacrifices. So that's how the Buddha starts out his teaching on karma and action. There is goodness in the world because people can choose. Okay, then from those principles he would give what's called a graduated teaching or a gradual teaching. He'd go through various topics. It starts with generosity, virtue. And then the rewards that come from generosity and virtue. We talk about heaven. That's another part of the teaching on karma. There's a life after this one. And the actions we do in this lifetime bear results now and on into the future. But then heaven isn't permanent. You can have some good times up sporting with your fellow devas, and then you have to fall again. And then you, when you fall, you fall hard. There are a couple of people I knew in Thailand who were constantly dissatisfied. You can never do enough for them. And John Fung made a comment about them one time. He said they were devas in a previous lifetime. I don't like being human beings again. And so there's a danger. There are drawbacks to even the good rewards that you would have as you wander through various states of being and becoming. And that's when the Buddha after talking on that topic, we'd talk about the rewards of renunciation, looking for a higher happiness, trading in the happiness of, that comes from generosity and virtue and for the sake of a happiness that's more lasting. That comes with giving up your desire for sensual pleasures, looking for something deeper inside, more lasting inside. Once you see the rewards of renunciation, and then he said, you'll be ready for the Four Noble Truths. Willingness to turn around and look, even when things are going well. Okay, things could, these things that are going well are not going to go well forever. And is it really satisfactory? There's always going to be a hitch. There's always going to be something impermanent. There's always stress, even in the pleasure. But the cause comes from the craving that tends to go along with the pleasure. So you want to look for that, and you want to develop the qualities of mind that can see that craving and develop this passion for it. This is why we develop all the different factors of the path, why we're sitting here concentrating right now trying to be mindful, trying to get the mind centered. So can find a pleasure that lies above the sensual pleasure, because only if you find this pleasure that comes from stillness can the mind get a better perspective on its sensual desires. 
So here you are cultivating the desire for a higher pleasure, which is perfectly fine. It's part of right effort. That was another thing I read recently. This one teacher had written something. He said, with the purpose of getting people to get rid of their craving for awakening. Well, that's really destructive. The Buddha said, the desire for awakening, the desire to be skillful, to bring skillfulness to fruition, that's part of the path. And as Ananda said, the craving to gain awakening is something that's necessary to practice. So we're working on this desire to create a better state of mind, a more solid state of mind, both because it gives a higher pleasure and because it puts in the mind in a better position to see its movements. To exactly where is that movement of craving? What does it look like? How do you recognize it? Where is the stress? There are stresses that are simply part of the fact that thing ar things arise and pass away. But then there's the stress that comes from craving, and it's a slightly different stress. And it's the one you can really do something about. And it's the one that really causes suffering the suffering that digs deep into the mind. So this is how you prepare the mind to start using the Four Noble Truths. And master the skills around them so that at some point you will have the skills fully mastered. And that's when even the truths get put aside. And this is why the Buddha had that image of the raft. The Four Noble Truths are part of the raft. You don't carry them around after you've gotten to the other shore. But while you're crossing the river, you, you don't want to let them go. If you let go of the raft, you just get swept down the river. And going with the flow of the river doesn't lead you to good places. The image the Buddha has is of being led to monsters and whirlpools and crocodiles and other beasts down the river. So we hold on to the raft to get across. So while we're crossing, we hold on to the, the path, hold on to all the factors of the path. But it's always good to have in the back of your mind the, the conviction, okay, this will lead to true freedom, total, ultimate. The conviction that can be tested, that can actually be verified in this lifetime. And that's a wonderful truth.